Today we're going to talk about dynamic assessment. So before we get started, I just want to note that um, I am getting paid to do this presentation, um, but I have no uh, non-financial uh, tasks related to this topic of dynamic assessment. So hopefully at the end of this recording, um, you'll be able to describe the underlying principles of dynamic assessment, discuss the benefits of using dynamic assessment during an evaluation, and uh, have some ideas on how to develop dynamic assessment plans for your students with a variety of speech and language disorders. So the first thing we should probably talk about is why you might want to consider dynamic assessment. So to do this, it'll be best if we watch a video to exemplify uh, this topic of dynamic assessment. So I'm going to make two rows of quarters. Okay. Does this row have more quarters? Does this row have more quarters or are they the same? The same. The same? Okay. Now watch. Now. Does this row have more quarters? Does this row have more quarters, or are they the same? That one has more quarters. That one has more quarters? So um, based on that short video, what I would like everybody to do is answer this question, um, where you think the child's breakdown is um, with this particular task. Is it A, understanding same different, B, understanding more or less, um, C, understanding the interaction of same, different, and more or less, or D, understanding one-to-one -one counting. And now we're going to watch just a little bit more in this next video. So I'm going to make two rows of quarters. Okay. Does this row have more quarters? Does this row have more quarters, or are they the same? The same. The same? Okay, now watch. Now, does this row have more quarters? Does this row have more quarters, or are they the same? That one has more quarters. That one has more quarters? Yeah. Why does that one have more quarters? Because it's stretched out. Because it's stretched out? Yes. Okay, so how many are in this row? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, how many are in this room? One, two, three, four, five. So, are there more in this room? This room, or are they the same? The same. The same? Yeah. Okay. So again, with this just little bit uh, of added information, I would like to ask you to ask to answer that same question that we had previously about where you think the breakdown is. Um, and you may have the same answer, you may change your answer, that's fine. So now one last time, we're going to watch the video of this child, but he's going to do a different task. Um, and I want you, we're going to go back to that question again, um, but uh, watch this video and see what you think. Tell me. I'm going to pour blue water into each of these cups, and you're going to have to tell me when they're the, when they have the same amount. Okay. Okay. Tell me when this one is the same. The same. The same. Those two are the same now. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, now watch this. We're going to take the blue water from this glass and we're going to pour it into this glass. Now, does this glass have more water? Does this glass have more water or are they the same? It has more water. This one has more water? Yeah. Can you tell me why? Because that one's higher than that one. That one's higher than that one. Right. Can you tell me? Does this ball have more Play-Doh? Does this ball have more Play-Doh, or are they the same? That one has more Play-Doh. That, that one has more? Yeah. Let's make them, let's try and make them the same. Make them into two of the same size. What about, what about now? They're the same. They're the same now? Yeah. Okay, now watch. Now. 
this one have more Play-Doh? Does this one have more Play-Doh, or are they the same? That one has more Play-Doh. That one has more Play-Doh? Can you tell me why? You smushed that one. Because that one's smushed. How about... How about now? Does this one have more Play-Doh? Does this one have more Play-Doh, or are they the same? The same. Now they're the same? Why are they the same? You roll that one back up. Okay. Great. So again, I think the question we have to ask ourselves now with all of this information is where we think his breakdown is um, and kind of think about that. And the reason why I um, brought up this particular video, um, which is actually from uh, cognitive psychology testing, and a lot of you may have watched it when you were in Psych 101 in college, um, because these are tasks that Piaget and Vygotsky had put together to demonstrate the um, interaction between cognitive and language development that happens. Um, but with traditional standardized tests, one of the issues that we have with them is that we ask a question um, in a specific way, seeking a specific answer, but really all we find out is whether or not somebody gets it right or wrong. Um, the reason behind why they get it right or wrong or where they're at in the learning process, you know, we're kind of like this little girl. We just don't really know when we give the standardized test. And this is one of the weaknesses of standardized tests um, that dynamic assessment can help uh, alleviate some of that. Um, and so this is just an option. And, and again, part of the reason is not to take away the standardized test. It's really to help um, maximize the information that you get so that we can know where the breakdown is, um, is that breakdown at the right place, and um, what do we need to do for intervention. Um, so that's kind of a demonstrated way of explaining um, why we might want to consider dynamic assessment within our activities um, when we may plan an evaluation. So there's actually a variety of ways that you can do dynamic assessment. And so we're gonna talk about the, the different options that are available to you. I think one version, um, which is the pre-test, teach, post-test, um, is really commonly known, but it's actually, um, in a definition, uh, dynamic assessment is a method of conducting a language assessment which seeks to identify the skills that an individual child possesses as well as their learning potential. Um, and I think this is especially important when we talk about dynamic assessment. Um, in reality, we do a version of dynamic assessment with a lot of our speech tests. It's not uncommon for us to do stimulability on the Goldman Fristo to see, you know, which sounds a child is stimulable for, um, how, is he, how easily do they make adaptations when they're given feedback or specific instructions. That is a dynamic assessment type of a task. So we do utilize it for things broader than just language assessment. I could envision doing the same thing with a child with a fluency disorder where, you know, within the evaluation process, you know, are they able to learn what an easy onset is? How easily do they um, incorporate that even within a short session into their strategies? And is there any carryover whatsoever? Or is it like very difficult for them to engage in that type of an activity? So um, I like to think that dynamic assessment can be broader than even this ASHA definition. Um, but today we're going to focus primarily on the language side, but I do want to remind you that in reality we use these um, types of activities. We may call them a different name like stimulability, um, but stimulability is a dynamic assessment type of an activity. So we're going to talk a little bit first about static assessment versus dynamic assessment. And our standardized tests are our traditional static assessment. And dynamic assessment is this ability to look at how somebody does something, responds to feedback um, and instruction, and is able to generalize. Um, so with our participants, when we have a static assessment, our student is very passive. Um, I give them the stimulus the question and then they're supposed to give me a response and I judge it to be right or wrong. 
um, in a dynamic assessment, the student is supposed to be actively engaged in an activity, actively learning, actively participating, asking questions, interacting. It's a very different process um, and the role of the learner, uh, the student is very different. Um, with a static assessment, I, the examiner, I'm just going to observe your behavior and determine whether or not that's right or wrong. Um, in a dynamic assessment, we're going to be interacting back and forth, um, much like treatment, uh, because the student will do something, I will provide some kind of feedback, and then the student can respond to that. Um, and again, I'm then going to interact. So there's a much more um, interactive back and forth um, participation on both people. Um, a static assessment can be very good at identifying where there are deficits um, because we are, you know, kind of starting off where students know something when we're getting that basal, working up to where we get the ceiling with the idea that we're going to stress them beyond where um, they have mastered a skill. Um, in contrast, dynamic assessments real purpose is to look at how modifiable somebody is. So how easy is it for me to teach you something? How is the, easy is it for you to learn that something? So it's a very different process when we think about um, the purpose, um, the roles, um, and then with a static assessment, it's going to be very standardized. We have instructions that we're supposed to follow. We have what are determined as right and wrong answers to be scored. Um, you know, we even know that we can repeat or not repeat. All of that information is available to us with a static assessment. Um, and a dynamic assessment is highly structured and organized, but there is a lot more fluidity and responsiveness to the student to help them um, learn information and to, to see that. So um, I wouldn't put it as completely unstandardized, but it is going to be a much more um, dynamic and interactive uh, activity as compared to a standardized test. So dynamic assessment really emerged actually probably in the late 80s, early 90s um, as, the, as we became more aware of some concerns with static assessment. Um, the first concern that we always have with any kind of standardized test is that it, it does tend to isolate speech and language skills in an abnormal way. Um, so when we're doing a speech test, you know, most of us don't go around labeling pictures and single words um, when we talk. And so, you know, yes, that can evaluate your ability to produce speech sounds, but that doesn't take into account what might break down when you're actually trying to talk continuously or interact with people um, in a distracted or loud environment even. Um, same thing with language skills, you know. Um, receptive language is often evaluated on a standardized test in a way that you don't actually use receptive language in day-to-day -day, um, interactions. You know, we don't point to pictures after hearing a sentence, um, but rather uh, we have an interaction with people and we're either being asked to go um, to the grocery store and pick up some food that we need or we're being asked where something is in the house or you know, those types of questions where our receptive language is being assessed. And then um, when we talk about expressive things, a lot of the tasks are very um, isolated where you're filling in a short word or I give you words and you have to reorganize them into a sentence that matches a picture. Um, none of those are tasks that are normal and that we do in normal day-to-day -day activities. Um, Another type of concern is that um, we have these isolated areas that are being um, evaluated and it's really hard to find standardized tests that um, integrate holistic types of activities that are similar to how we use language um, and that integrate the demands of the classroom in our case, since we're dealing with school-age students, um, as well as the teacher's expectations 
um, for independence, the ability to retain information for a period of time, the ab ability to break down a task into smaller steps so that you know how to proceed and I don't have to give you all of those small steps every single time. Um, and again, that isolation of the skill uh, can res result in um, in the student performing in a way that maybe doesn't match what you're hearing in these other things. I know I've done evaluations where um, students were not doing well in a classroom. I had one particular high schooler who um, was really struggling in school and we gave her the standardized, um, we gave her the ALS too. And um, she did score within normal limits, but she probably took two to three minutes of constant talking in the circumlocution um, manner to get to the right answer. And because the ALS2 doesn't say that you can't self-correct um, and we had to take her correct answer, but I can definitely tell you that we understood why teachers did not view her as learning information because no teacher is going to allow a student to talk for two to three minutes in order to answer a question um, during a class. So again, some of the w things that happen on a standardized test may not match the real world expectation of that school skill. So one of the things that we've seen with dynamic assessment and why we might want to do it is that it has been shown in research to really improve your sensitivity and specificity and the accuracy of your diagnosis as a result. And so, you know, the ability to not misdiagnose someone as either having a disorder or not having a disorder is greatly increased when we utilize dynamic assessment. Um, so there are certain factors that we know put a family or a student at risk for being diagnosed. And all of these are here right now, you know, low SES, um, a multi-language learner or ESL student. Um, there are certain uh, race and gender issues that can come up in ethnicity, um, mother's education level, all of these um, are factors where we see an increased rate of um, speech and language disorders. And so these are things that um, we also know in reality, standardized tests exasperate this. Um, so, you know, you have a multi-language learner or you have um, someone that comes from a different socioeconomic status, um, they're uh, more likely to perform poorer on a standardized test because it doesn't match um, and, and they come to the situation not at the same level as a lot of other students. And so um, with that increased likelihood of misdiagnosis, when you use only a standardized test, um, dynamic assessment can be a good way to ensure that you're not over-diagnosing or misdiagnosing. So the other thing that happens um, with those populations is a lot of times they come to us not having the same experiences as their peers. Um, and in this state like West Virginia, we know that's particularly true um, because we have a high proportion of low SES students. Um, just over 50% of the students in this state are classified as low SES, which means that they qualify for free and reduced lunch. And that proportion is much higher than most states in the nation, um, which means that, especially in relation to language, our students are at a very high risk for having um, low vocabularies because we know that they're not getting read to. Um, they may not be in daycares that are utilizing um, educational activities all day. Um, we know that they tend to not go on vacations and be exposed to larger items, um, go to museums, do the types of activities where, you know, in particular, you're going to get exposed to a diverse vocabulary. You're going to be exposed to um, a lot of complex syntax with the books, especially. And so because of that, um, we don't necessarily want to just assess where their language skills are, but we want to assess their ability to learn um, because kids with language disorders do not learn in the same way or at the same pace as their typically developing peers. And so um, when we talk about Vygotsky and 
uh, what he's talking about with this zone of proximal development in particular, um, we're talking about this um, noticing when someone does something or isn't able to do something, you have these things that you can do all by yourself. You have things that you can do with a little bit of support. So um, my children at home are quite capable of doing chores, but to tell them to just clean the house, it doesn't normally get clean. But if I just do something so simple as leave a list, then they're going to be able to do it. So that would be an example of things you can do with a little bit of help um, and things that you can't do yet, no matter how much support is given. Those are the things that are outside of our zone of proximal development, and we're just not ready for them yet. Um, for me, uh, there are many things um, that fall into that realm uh, and, and for all of us. And so these are things that we have to be taught um, some of those underlying skills first. So we have these different zones and zone two is really where we're trying to focus with a um, dynamic assessment type of an activity. Zone one are the things that they master and they're able to do really well. Um, but then we have um, zone three that is completely out of their ability to um, complete those types of tasks. So again, going back to dynamic assessment and why we might want to consider using it um, is, is really to focus on not just skills that they do or don't have um, at, at an independent level, but also to really look at that learning potential and how big of a gap is it that's missing. And that's really to help facilitate us even if we do have a student that qualifies um, in writing our goals so that we know what, you know, where that breakdown is because um, just because they missed something on that test, it may be in zone three that we were just talking about up here, in which case that's not really a goal that you may be able to master in a year. Maybe you can, but um, a lot of things in zone three are not yet attainable. Um, but maybe we really need to focus on those zone two behaviors when we're writing our goals for our students on IEPs. So here's an example. Um, I find that one-to-one -one counting is a good way for us to kind of get an actual visual. So we're going to all watch Charlie, um, and he's going to demonstrate his counting ability, um, but also his ability to kind of not just do one-on-one -on -one counting, but of specific items. Um, and so this is a more complex task than even just one-to-one -one counting. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven, sixteen. Very good. This time, why don't you line all the red ones up as you count them? So take them out and line them up in a line. One. Good boy. Two. Three. Yep. Oh, hang on. Is that one red? No. Oh, it's blue. We should get all the red ones together first and then you can count them all. That's it. Good. Is there any more? No. Nope. Oh, yeah. Okay, now try and count them for me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, can you count them again? And this time, touch them when you count them. One, touch each one. Good boy. Two, yep. three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You did it! So, how many are there? One. Two, eight, oh, one, two, three, four, seven. Oh. Start again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well done. Top work. And where are the blue ones? Okay. One, two, three, 
four, five. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five. Fantastic. Where are the orange? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Try again, and this time count, touch each one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well five, done. So as you saw with Charlie, um, you know, he really, it, if you were to just give him a one-to-one -one counting task, he would have not passed it, and that's what you would have seen. But what you could see with his mom is that she was doing this prompting and he was able to start um, having improvements in his ability to do this task. So while initially we might have thought, oh, he just can't count, um, what we really saw was that he was able to do it with some supports put in place um, and uh, some other things. And we'll talk a little more in depth about that example um, but really, there are a variety of ways, like I mentioned before, that we can do dynamic assessments during an evaluation. And so one category is to actually adapt your standardized test. Um, and so uh, to do that, you can modify your test items. Um, after a question or a probe, you can ask the student why they provided the answer that they did or you can provide feedback on answers. Now, one of the things that I want to clarify on this particular um, group of options is that if you need a standardized test score, you're going to have to administer the test according to its instructions first, and then go back and do these adapt a test types of options that you can do on dynamic assessment. One of the other things that came out when I was doing the live presentation of this also that I want to clarify is that you don't have to do this for an entire test or for all of a, a subtest or for all of the subtests on a test. You may just have specific subtests or specific questions that you want to do these types of activities because you know there is this efficiency piece and you don't necessarily um, have time to start at the beginning and go all the way through but it can be interesting to even see if a student's able to explain um, the answers that they get right as well as the answers that they get wrong so I would encourage you to kind of explore um, both the questions that they got right as well as the questions that they got wrong and we're going to talk about these in more depth individually here in a minute so I'm going to kind of leave those adapt to test options for now. Um, and then we have the options for dynamic assessment that are probably a little more common to us. And those are um, assess, teach, and retest. Um, and we're going to talk about what that might look like. And then we're also going to uh, do a version of evaluating someone's teachability. And so that's something that is another option that we can do um, when we're trying a dynamic assessment type of an activity. Um, so adapting tests to determine the breakdown. So we're going to talk about what that might look like. So if you were going to ask a student why, um, on the self five, there's the sentence prompt where I read the sentence and the student's supposed to point to the matching picture. So on this particular one where I say, point to the girls have dressed for the game. And then um, the student might point to a picture and I could say something like, tell me why you picked that picture. Or I might say, you pointed to whichever picture, why? Um, and so these would be prompts that kind of probe into trying to figure out if the student understands um, past tense and that if the students already dressed for the game, they should be standing there ready to go play. And so um, are they able to kind of explain that process? Um, when we go to modify the test, again, I'm using the same prompt um, of the girls have dressed for the game. Um, I, if the student were to get the question wrong, I might do the prompt and this time actually stress the girls have dressed for the game um, and see if they change their answer. Uh, if they still get it wrong, I might say the girls have dressed for the game. So are they already dressed or do they need to get dressed? 
Um, again, I'm trying to get them to clue into that. Um, my next prompt might be have dressed means they are done. So which picture matches the girls have dressed for the game? Um, and again, this is just kind of to point out that I'm going to see if that one of the other things to keep in mind when you're doing these prompts is you want to keep the prompts pretty similar from test item to test item. So you want because you don't want to have to come up with a different prompting hierarchy for each question. So really keep your prompts as similar as possible um, so that they would work for any of those particular tasks. Another option is to provide feedback. And so um, again, the girls have dressed for the game. If they get it right, I might say something like, that's right. Have dressed means they are done dressing. This picture shows they are dressed and are ready for the game. If they got it wrong, I might say something like, have dressed means they're done dressing. This picture shows the girls are still getting dressed. So it doesn't match the girls have dressed for the game. And so again, I'm going to kind of give them some things um, and see maybe they realize they need to pay more closely to the prompt um, when they're picking their picture. So now what I would like you to do is to look at this prompt. The girl is being pushed by the boy and um, come up with an example of what you might do for ask the student why. And then for this same example, think about how you might modify this particular prompt um, and what kind of a prompt you might give for a modify the test. And last, um, you could think about what you might do for provide feedback. So now I want you to kind of think about this because in reality, all these options that we just went over, some may work better for different types of tests than others. So we're just gonna go through a couple of examples of test items on the self five to kind of start thinking about it. And the first is word classes. So if the prompt is, which two words go together, North, Celsius, globe, or West? Um, you know, which of those options, you know, ask why, modify the test, or provide feedback do you think would work best? Similarly, um, you can kind of think about for following directions, um, point to the second circle and the third triangle, go. You know, is that going to be something where you can ask them why? Um, is that something that really works for modify the test um, and then providing feedback? So I think what I want you to think about is matching which of those might go for a different type of a subtest. Another example from the self five is the sem semantic relationships. Um, the dog sat under the table next to the cat. The food was in a dish on the table. The food was next to the dog, above the cat, under the table, or on the table. And so again, um, they're supposed to come up with the two viable options um, off of what you said. Which of these would work best? And here we have an example from formulated sentences where you're supposed to use the word instead with this particular picture prompt. Um, and you can think about which of those three dynamic assessment options are available to you when we go to look at um, changing how we do the standardized test. Again, I want to go back and re-emphasize before we move on to the other types of dynamic assessment. I really want to re-emphasize that if you need that standardized test score, which we do in West Virginia, we need a 78 to qualify for services, um, you need to first uh, do the test in its entirety the way it's supposed to be done so that you can gain that standardized score um, and then 
go back and do one of your options and you might need to reintroduce this. You know, I just want to learn a little bit more about how you responded to your questions. So we're going to go back and look at your answers. I would remind them of what they had answered when you give them the prompt um, because they may not remember. You may also find out that they self-correct at that point. You can't change your answer, but that's something that you can note off to the side. Um, that when you went back to prompt them that they gave a different response. So again, um, please uh, remember to administer the test first the way it's supposed to, and then that way you can strategically go back and look into the areas of the subtests or, or the different tasks, which may be aligned specifically to concerns in the classroom or concerns from the parent or the student. Um, and those are the questions that you really want to delve into to figure out where they're at with their breakdown. Um, so now we had the options of teaching a skill uh, in order to see if they need services. Um, in particular with kids that are low SES or English language learners, this can be very helpful at um, not just so that you can go beyond where they're at in their learning, but also start to evaluate um, whether or not they need ongoing services. So we have two options available to us. The first is the test teach retest, um, and that's probably the most common uh, dynamic assessment that we think about. The other can be done in conjunction with test teach retest, um, or it could be your evaluation um, tool, but you're going to teach a skill and then evaluate how much support you had to provide the student on a one to five scale. So five is, you know, I'm all but virtually doing hand over hand assistance and one would be very minimal assistance, you know, maybe just one verbal prompt and then they were able to do a task. Um, the second thing that you evaluate is how accurate they are on completing the tasks that you're asking them to do. Um, so you could do that with these percentage ranges that align with um, our uh, accuracy on whatever that task is and, and whatever that might look like. Um, so we'll kind of talk about these here in a little bit, but kind of go back and think about Charlie. Um, and we're going to watch that video one more time uh, and think about him in relation to, you know, where do we think he's at on his modifiability? Where do we think he's at on the level of support that is needed um, and what you might rate him? But then also think about, you know, if I was going to assess his counting um, and then really focus on teaching specific skills and then retesting what that might look like. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven, Very good. This time, why don't you line all the red ones up as you count them? So take them out and line them up in a line. One. Good boy. Two. Three. Yep. Oh, hang on. Is that one red? No. Oh, it's blue. We should get all the red ones together first and then you can count them all. That's it. Good. Nine. Is there any more? No. Nope. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Now try and count them for me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Can you count them again? And this time, touch them when you count them. One, touch each one. Good boy. Two. Yep. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You did it. So how many are there? One. Two, eight, oh, one, two, three, four, seven. Oh. Start again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well done. Top work. And where are the blue ones? Okay. 
One, two, three, four, five. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five. Fantastic. Where was the orange? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Try again and this time count, touch each one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well done. So when we talk about that test, teach, retest, I'm going to kind of initially talk about this in relation to Charlie, just to give you some an example. So maybe after watching this video, I decide that I want Charlie to be able to um, sort by color, which he could clearly sort by color. He knew his colors. He could sort. And I also want him to be able to count specific items that he's requested. So he's really having difficulty with this complex direction um, in that it's hard for him to realize that first he needs to sort the different shapes into their similar colors and then he should count. And so um, I'm just going to dump a bunch of stuff out and ask him, you know, how many triangles are there how many uh, green circles are there and I can have him do all of that um, and see how many he counts accurately and then I'm going to teach him how to do this in a very strategic way that from now on when I ask you to do something like this I'm going to dump it out and I probably am not going to do it just with shapes. I'm going to teach him with maybe a bucket of animals and then maybe a bucket of cars. And so I'm going to try in, in the intervention phase to throw other things at him because I want him to generalize that skill beyond just sorting and counting shapes that are different colors. Um, and then I'm going to do almost exactly the same activity that I did at my pretest as my post test. So maybe I pretest with the shapes. I do my intervention with things that aren't shapes, and then I post test with shapes and see if he's now able to accurately count after this instruction. Um, and so again, that's that's how that might look for Charlie and his task. But now let's kind of think about this in relation to speech and language. Um, so with articulation, I might assess, you know, on the Goldman Fristo where they're at with a sound, and then I'm going to teach that sound for one or two sessions. Well, I'm going to have some target words, um, and maybe I have 10 target words with that particular sound or, or groups of sounds in them. Um, and half of those I will teach and half of those I will not teach during the intervention. And I do that on purpose because um, when I go to take data, I want to not only take data on the taught words, but I also want to take data on the untaught words to see if when I do my post testing, am I getting generalization to my untaught words? So maybe I have a, a bank of 10 words that are my pre-test and post-test and I'm going to teach and do the treatment with five of those words um, for one or two sessions and see if I get improvement. So I could do that with articulation, similar type of thing with vocabulary. You could do it with narratives and trying to work on complex sentences or story grammar, um, morphosyntax verb tense agreement. Um, you could try and work on some of those things and voice and fluency. So again, I want you to think about this, even though I'm going to hone in on language in reality, you could do a lot of this in other areas as well. So here's an example um, of a narrative um, that I did during an evaluation. Um, and so first I had to kind of select my task and, and what the task was and the skills that the student needed. And in order for this student to generate a story, he was going to have to look at, at a single episode picture. So I believe um, one of the pictures, I'm not sure if it was the first one or second one, I showed him a picture of a boy in a park and um, I think his dog was there and they were playing in the snow. And so he was supposed to make up a story about that. So he has to understand what should go into a story. Um, 
But then he also has to understand that when he's putting that story together, his sentences need to be grammatical. He needs to use appropriate words because, you know, I'm not going to be familiar with his story. So he needs to be pretty specific and I should see some pretty complex sentences because it's a narrative and not conversation. So I'm going to show him the first picture. I'm going to ask him to tell me a story. Um, he's going to do that. And then I'm going to do some intervention, which you're going to watch in the video. It took me about 10 or 12 minutes to do that intervention. And then I'm going to do my post assessment that needs to be almost exactly. And what you'll see in this example is I show him another single episode picture. It's a little bit different than the last one, but it's a similar type of a single episode picture about a little boy. Um, and then he's asked um, using the same prompt to make up a story. Um, and so we're going to watch this play out so that you can see how you might do a dynamic assessment even in a single session, how long it might take, that type of thing. So um, with this example, you can, you're going to see the pretest, which is about two minutes. There's instruction. Um, there are actually some things that I'll talk about after the video that I would have done differently now because I don't think it's as clean as it, it could have been. Um, and I think it actually lengthened the time quite a bit that if I modified it down into the simpler version, it would have fallen into this two minutes, um, 12 minutes of instruction and four, four minutes tops for the post testing. I don't even think it would be. Um, so now let's watch this example and then I'll tell you what I would have done differently. Start whenever you want. A kid was rolling the snowball in the snow and he was having fun. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about what stories have in them. What's your favorite story that you've read? Or you've watched a movie? A Nitro Circus. Which one? Nitro Circus. Nitro Circus. Okay. So in that, is that a movie? Okay. In that movie they had characters, right? Yeah. And they gave their characters names. Mm -hmm. What were your characters' names in Nitro Circus? Travis, and I don't remember the other names. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so if we were going to tell your story again about the little boy rolling his snowball, what kind of a name do you think we could give him? Any name you George. Want? George, okay. So that would make our story a little more interesting, right? So we'll name him George, and he's playing out in the snow, and that's where he is, right? Mm -hmm. That's his setting. So our good stories tell us where the stories happen. So George was playing in the snow at a park. Do you have any parks in the city that you like to go play at? The swimming pool. The swimming pool. Does the swimming pool have a name? Uh, no. No? Is it the Nest City Pool? Yes. Okay. So that's the name. So we could say that he was at the Nest City Park by the pool, right? So George was building a snowman at the Nest City Park in the snow. And all of our stories need to have some kind of a takeoff that happens. And what a takeoff is, it can be something that's a problem, something that's funny, or something that's scary. Do you want his story to have something funny, a problem, or scary happen? Funny. Something funny. Okay, so what could be something funny that happens when you're building a snowman in the park? The snow ball rolls over you. So the snow blew in his face maybe, right? And how do you think he felt when cold. the snow... He felt cold and maybe he felt cold and sad or maybe cold and mad. Which one do you think? Cold and sad. Okay, so George was in the Nest City Park building a snowman when snow blew in his face and it made him feel sad and cold. That was what we said. I have to keep saying it or I'm going to forget our story. 
So what might be something that he plans to do to make himself feel better? Go inside and okay. warm up. Okay, so George was playing in the Nest City Park when snow blew in his face as he was building a snowman and he felt mad, no, sad and cold. So he decided, that's one of those words because when we decide something it happens up here, that's why there's bubbles there. So he decided to go home and get warm. Now he's going to have to have an action. He How does he? Home? Yeah, so he ran home as fast as he could down the street. And then our story lands. See, our rocket takes off and then it lands. And so what's he going to do when he gets, how does it end? He goes to bed. So he crawled into his bed and got all warm. And then how did he feel? Good. And then he felt better because he wasn't cold anymore. So let's tell our whole story again. I'm going to do it first. George was playing in the Nest City Park in the snow, building a snowman. All of a sudden, the snow blew in his face, and he felt cold and sad. George decided that he would go home and get warm. So he ran down the street to his house and into the door to his bed and crawled inside. And then he felt all happy because he was nice and warm. And that is the end. Okay, so now you get to have a turn telling the story. George was playing at the Nest City Park and the snow building his summer. All of a sudden, snow blew in his face. He felt sad and cold. And he decided to go home. Mm -hmm. He ran at home as fast as he could and went, went inside the door and crawled into his covers and woke up and he was all better. Very good. Okay, so this time I'm going to show you a new picture and I want you to make up the story. And what I want you to do is to draw out your parts so like here we could have drawn, or I'll draw on this one. On here, when you were planning this story with these pictures, we could have drawn George. And I'm not as good of an artist, so I would have just kind of done stick figures. So George, and then I could have drawn a picture of the park and a snowball. So you don't have to write any words. We just want to write pictures so we can remember our different parts of the story. So then I could draw wind blowing snow into George's face. Oh, he's probably not happy when the snow blows in his face, right? And there's his snowball, and he's at the park. And then I could draw that George is sad, and then I could have him shaking because he's cold. Right? Because we said he was sad and cold. So then he could decide, and I like to do the little bubbles, so he could decide he wants to go home, okay? And so then he ran. Now I have to try and draw George running. He looks like he's falling, but, you know, that's the best I can do. So he's running as fast as he can. I'll draw tennis shoes on him since he's running home. Okay, down the street. We don't need to worry about this one. And then he goes into his house, there's the door, and here's George getting home. He goes into his house, and he gets into his bed, and gets all warm in his blanket. Okay? So on the next story, I want you to use your pictures to draw out your story before you tell me it. Okay? And try and remember to name your setting. Remember how we named it Nest City Park? And we named our character because we told, called him George this time instead of the boy. And that was great. Okay? So this one is yours. And I'm going to show you a new picture. And you get to think for a while. And then whenever you're ready, you can tell me your new story. Okay? Mm -hmm. There's your new picture.
You can draw. Just put everyone. Oh, you know what? I'm going to draw an X in this one because you don't have to do it. We didn't talk about that. How would you make the character? Well, you can draw a picture of the kid. You don't have to draw the dog unless you want to. And then you just need to think about what you want to have happen in your story. So what's your kid's name? Bob. Bob. Okay. I just picked Bob now because I'm quite forget. There you go. Yeah, you know, that's a good idea. I have to write notes all the time, too. Bob. B-O-B. Uh-huh. Good job. Okay, so... Betty. Mm-hmm. At the, at the farm. At the farm. Oh, that's a great place. Do we want to name our farm? I don't know. What's a symbol that kind of means a farm? What's a picture? You want to draw a barn so you can remember it's a farm? Sure. I always think of barns when I think of farms. Kind of remind rhymes. Yeah, big doors because tractors are big. Okay, so he was at the farm. And what's going to happen? Remember, we can have our takeoff be something funny, something scary, or something that's a problem. And his parents left him. Oh, no. So he's at home all alone. How are we going to draw that? Or you can just write a word there. Is that the house? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You could draw a picture of them driving away in the car. How's that? Or Bob. Okay. There's Bob. That's Bob, right? Mm -hmm. And that's his parents leaving. Oh dear. And his dog. So how did Bob feel? Mad. Okay, so draw a mad face on Bob. Yeah, those look like mad eyes. Bob's mad, so what's he going to decide to do? Walk to his friends. Okay, that's a good plan. So why don't you draw a picture of him deciding to walk? What's our keyword that we say here when we say it's the plan? Bob de decides. decided. Mm -hmm. Excellent job. Bob decided to walk to a friend. So now you need to draw a picture of him because his action, what he does to fix his problem of being left at home, is that he goes is walking. So how's our story going to land? He got left at home, and so he got to his friends. And they took him home. Okay. Should he maybe call his parents? Yeah. Because our problem was that they left. So he got to his friend's house and called his mom and dad. So how am I go that? Could you draw Bob with a phone in his hand at his friend's house?
job. So Bob called his parents. And then I think our wrap up is that they, they picked him up. Yeah, his parents picked him up. And how did Bob feel? Good. Okay, so draw a picture of Bob's parents and him together, and he's going to have to have a smile on his face because he feels good. Now, when you tell your story, you can look at your picture so you can remember everything, okay? So now you tell me the story of Bob. Bob was at the farm, and his parents left him, and he was mad, and he wanted to, he was thinking to go to his friends to call his parents, and he was running, and he caught he got to his friends and called his parents, and at the end, they picked them up and drove off. Excellent job! That's Okay, so before we go into the differences of the story, I, I want to talk a little bit. So you saw me do the pre-testing, um, you saw me do the instruction, and then you saw me do the post-testing. The thing that I made a mistake on and that I should not have done is that I allowed him to use the planning sheet for his post-testing, but he didn't get given that during his pre-testing. So to keep this really clean, what I should have done was pre-tested him, done the instruction, and then post-tested him exactly the same way without the actual drawing um, and using the visual graphic organizer. Um, I love the graphic organizer when I'm actually doing real intervention with kids. Um, I think it can be very helpful and it transfers nicely um, to help them learn how to take notes um, because we use it in reverse. Um, but really, if I was to design this dynamic assessment properly, I should have done the pre-testing and the post-testing exactly the same and not had different tools. So um, full disclosure, that could have been better. Um, but you can see from that example, I have the two stories that we listed before and after, and they are very different. You know, his first story, a kid was rolling the snowball in the snow and he was having fun. I really don't have an initiating event. I don't have this, the, the character doing um, activities that are related to an initiating event. So they're not purposeful actions um, and there's really no conclusion. Um, in the second story, he's already learned that he needs to introduce his character and provide a setting. He's added some emotions. We've got an initiating event that his parents left him. Uh, and so he has to, you know, have this metacognitive plan on what he's going to do. And he has some actions where he goes running to his friends um, and calls his parents. And then they come and pick him up and take him home. And so you can see that, you know, if I had written a goal off of his first story and that was the only narrative that I thought he could do, I would have completely underestimated his his ability with narratives. And so this is a prime example that sometimes what we're asking students to do um, during our, our evaluation is not something they're used to. They don't understand what we're telling them. But by doing this dynamic assessment, even in this short time period, I was able to see where he's really at with this particular skill and what his independent level really is as compared to what his skill could could have been thought to be after the first story. So now we're going to do a little more applied practice. Um, let's think about a preschooler. Um, he comes from a low SES home. Mom was has a high school education, but dad dropped out of high school. Um, he's been at home with grandma while they work during the day. Um, and he's not been in birth to three services. So we decide that we want to do a dynamic assessment because it's not surprising that this student is considered, you know, the preschool teacher has concerns because this is possibly his first time really being in a classroom type environment where things are highly structured and organized and 
and he may just look really different. So um, if I were to develop something associated with vocabulary, it works really nicely in a dynamic assessment to do vocabulary as my target and see how easily they learn new words. Um, so first I have to identify what I'm going to teach. In this case, we said vocabulary. Um, I have to think about how I'm going to assess it, how I'm going to teach the words, um, and then do my pretest intervention and post-testing. Um, and so, you know, the nice thing is there are articles out there where they have a lot of information in the methods section so you don't have to make up the activity. And so I'm going to give you an example. There was recently an article in 2012 where they did this type of a dynamic assessment. And so they picked three words the child knew and three words the child didn't know. So you might figure out that this child doesn't really know zoo animals, but they do know farm animals. So I'm going to pick three one, three zoo animals they don't know and three farm animals they don't know, they do know. I'm going to do my pretest to see how they do. Um, and then I'm going to do this teaching order. Now, the first thing that I want to do full disclosure on um, this particular article, they uh, were teaching non-words um, or kind of fake words. Um, obviously, you as an SLP don't want to do that because you're not trying to do research. So teaching words that aren't real isn't going to help the student. So I'm, I've made some modifications to the research article to make it practical for a clinician. Um, but this is basically the outline of what they did um, when they were in treatment they did they first taught did the treatment on two familiar words that the child already knew then they did two unfamiliar words and then they did one familiar word and one unfamiliar so that was the order for the six words that were in the bank um, they made sure that they did nine presentations of the words because they used a script and this is the part where i don't want to say that dynamic assessment is unstructured it is um, good dynamic assessment will be pretty structured so that you know for sure you didn't do more presentations of one word than the than others and maybe that's why a word didn't get taught um, and so it is pretty structured they even had a script um, where they were doing this play again you'll see that they have non words in here that they were trying to teach the child but you could utilize a similar type of script like this, but use real words, um, especially with the animals. And so these are the things that you might be able to utilize is this, and now you don't have to make up the script or anything. It's controlled for the number of presentations so that you know that you're gonna do this. Um, you can do it with puppets or little um, action figures. Um, or whatever so that it's more interactive and play-like and the child's engaged. But this is what your script might look like where it says, knock, knock, who is it? It's Mr. Chicken. The chicken brought her depa. So you might say the, the chicken brought her frog. Um, what's this? And then depending on what the child says, you'll either do the, the correct or the incorrect response um, and what they say and then say, Lola, wants you to look at it. Look at my frog. Um, so you can kind of see how this would would be interactive and enjoyable for a preschool age child um, to do the highly structured um, teaching of vocabulary words so you can do your pre and post assessment. They did this in a total of three sessions. So they pre-tested on the words, did a session, did another session and then I believe they post tested immediately after the second so this is not something that's labor intensive and would take a lot of time um, the next thing that I want to kind of do now that we've gone over dynamic assessment is I really want to talk about where dynamic assessment is headed if you remember way back at the beginning I mentioned that you know dynamic assessment is not something that's new um, in reality, it, it's been around for a long time, you know, even even before the 80s, because it's all based off of Vygotsky and the zone of proximal development, and that came out in the 70s, I believe. Um, and so, 
you know, this idea of dynamic assessment has been around for a long time, um, but it's it's been changing in uh, education and the educational setting um, to take on a new look. Um, and now a lot of people who are utilizing dynamic assessment at more of a school-wide level, you're going to know um, that this has turned into something new because it's now moved into, um, well, about 10 or 12 years ago, it was really pushed into response to intervention. And now that has been moved out of just reading and de decoding and phonological awareness where RTI was, was really focused for the longest time, which is a version of dynamic assessment to where now we're looking at it more school-wide and topic-wide to multi-tiered systems of support, that MTSS. So in reality, you know, I would think of dynamic assessment as what we can do within our evaluation process, but even within the schools, we're utilizing this multi-tiered systems of support, which is very much similar to this test, teach, retest model of the dynamic assessment. Um, so one of the things that you can do when you're at this larger level is that you're going to have classroom data a lot of times and, and you have three different ways that you make decisions about which kids you're concerned about and which kids you're not. Um, one of those is to use benchmarks and a lot of elementary grades especially have kind of moved away from grades and utilize a benchmark system. Um, by the end of a quarter, a student's supposed to be here in regards to his or her math skills and at the end of the second quarter, they're here. And so we just, we don't necessarily do grades, but we're making sure that they're hitting certain skill, knowledge and skills uh, uh, that they should be so that by the end of that grade, they've mastered their college and career readiness standards for that grade level. Um, so it's also important to remember that when we say college and career readiness standards, those things for second grade are supposed to be accomplished at the end of second grade, not at the beginning. And so really, you know, at the beginning of second grade, you're almost looking at the end of first grade benchmarks because that's where they're supposed to be starting and then beginning to acquire the new benchmark skills. Um, you can also look at a class or a grade level's means and standard deviations on a specific task or activity. Um, this would be similar to the state assessments or if a teacher gave a test um, on a, a reading assignment, um, you could do averages and look at the class performance. And then you can also do what we call visual inspection and that's where you graph it and you just see if you have outliers. We're going to be worried about the outliers on the low end, but sometimes you have outliers on the upper end too. But based on those decisions on who's not hitting their benchmarks or maybe who's more than one standard deviation away from their class average performance or, you know, someone who visually is performing lower than their peers, um, that particular student or group of students might be um, a concern and so then you would put them into this intention intervention with MTSS with the idea that once they've mastered that they go back into the classroom um, and join everybody else up and continue on. So um, again if you were doing this kind of pre-test post-test type of um, looking at means and standard deviations you have your class performance on a particular activity and you can look at the average score and if someone is more than six points let's say that you know our mean at the progress monitoring was a 12.1 um, or we could say 13 if we leave out number 10 I'll tell you about him later but he's kind of an outlier who's pulling our mean down but somebody who scored less than six would be somebody who was a concern because they would be more than one standard deviation below their peers. So when we look at the, a benchmark system, um, and all of this that I'm giving you for examples is actually from the, narr the test of narrative retell that accompanies your story um, champs intervention that many of you received from the state from Leanne um, last year. And so I kind of wanted to give you this example of a dynamic slash MTSS 
um, that you already have materials for, but they have grade level benchmarks or age level benchmarks for their test of narrative retell on what you would expect a five-year-old to be able to do when they're retelling. And so they, you know, a five-year-old should be able to earn a, a score of 16 and certain skills, because this is on a zero to two, certain skills should be pretty high level, um, or I guess a three um, on the episode bonus. But so these would be things that are, are where you expect the student to be. Again, here you can kind of see what a visual inspection, so that same data that I had given you with the means and standard deviations could be easily put into this um, line graph. And you can see that we have these four students grouped down at the bottom, four in the middle, and two at the top. So in a visual inspection of the data, we would be concerned with those four kids down at the bottom. Um, the others look to be kind of hitting in that average range, and then we have our above average students. So we're, we would kind of hone in and want to pay attention to um, those students on that bottom part that are kind of clumped together. So my example was that, you know, um, where I was before we uh, had this classroom of students because we went into the school and did prevention and enrichment, but um, during uh, the spring semester they had done their kindergarten roundup and they had some students who were age eligible for kindergarten, but the teachers and parents um, for a variety of reasons, either during that kindergarten screening or prior to that, because a lot of them had done preschool there, the decision was made that they weren't ready for kindergarten. And so they went into this pre-kindergarten class for a year and then would go into kindergarten the next year. So they were gonna be the old kids in their kindergarten group. Um, none of these kids had speech or language services previously. Um, the teacher had in that classroom for those at-risk students, there was very much an academic focus, much more so than a preschool classroom because really they were trying to give these kids a leg up with the idea that they would be the high performers in kindergarten because they were kind of getting a pre-kindergarten class. Um, they were working on writing, sound letter correspondence, um, writing their letters. Um, early sight words um, and some pre-reading types of activities, um, but the classroom itself had no structured teaching of pre-reading comprehension skills. So they weren't teaching anything about narratives and narrative structure um, like you might want uh, to improve reading comprehension down the road. So my task was that I was going to focus on that reading comprehension piece, but via oral narratives. And so we really wanted to make sure that the students understand the vocabulary words in their stories, um, that they were using complete sentences, understood the sentences in the story, um, and did they even really know what should be in a story. Um, all of these kind of lead into also pre-writing skills. Um, and the ability to do that. The research has gotten pretty strong um, more recently uh, with showing that kids that have better oral storytelling skills write better stories down the road. And so really developing this is all gonna fall in line with those college and career readiness standards. So um, the tool I used was the narrative um, language measures and specifically the test of narrative retail um, in that narrative language measures tool. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, just reach out to Leanne or me and we can get you in touch with it because it's free on the internet. Um, and it pairs, because the developers uh, are the same people for both of these, it pairs with Story Champs. And so that was going to be my intervention tool. Um, so again, I picked those because they go together nicely. Um, and whatnot. But the way this really worked out is that I did my pre-assessment. I did three whole group classroom sessions. Um, then I tested again. Um, the, then based on that, we grouped the kids either into a small group intervention that I ran or we did the teacher did the same lessons for the whole group class. Um, then I tested the kids again. Um, and then the kids that were still struggling moved to individual with me 
um, and the teacher continued to do the instruction in the classroom and we did the post testing. Um, in hindsight, and the developers of StoryChamps have, have done a similar type of study, they didn't do as long of sessions in each of these different tiers that you get with multi-tiered systems of support or RTI. Um, and so I think you could play with the length of this so that it would be more manageable in your school or with your entire workload. So um, there are also logistical pieces right now, given the fact that um, the West Virginia regulations don't necessarily align with um, the federal regulations and what they will permit is much broader than what West Virginia will permit. Um, I think that those are going to be changes that we as educators need to be pushing for um, and changing our role within this multi-tiered system to support and how we can um, assist with all students. But the point is, um, even if we're not doing these direct interventions, we should be helping structure them um, through the student improvement te teams or the student assessment teams. Um, so. Uh, knowledge of this is is important even if we're not the direct providers of these different interventions as we go when we went to look at all of the assessment at the end um, a couple of things that i want to note that were beneficial in doing this more dynamic assessment type of an approach first of all we had the student 10 that you saw earlier um, he would not respond to me when i would test him um, he would not answer questions. Um, and so what you see after the tier two support is that I asked his classroom teacher to start doing the assessment activity. And you can see that his performance greatly increased. And so there were reasons why we had never moved him into the small group instruction. And a lot of that was based on both her and I meeting and conferring about where we saw him during the group activities in the classroom and his classroom performance wasn't matching up with what we were seeing when I assessed him. And so, um, you know, that's the beauty of making team-based decisions is that I didn't over-identify him in that case. Um, the other four people that she had concerns about right here, um, we did end up referring them and moving them into the small group instruction because they were students that she was concerned with um, for different reasons for them. And then um, at the time too, two of those students were still not really making good improvements as compared to the other two over here um, who did make improvements. So they went back into the classroom. Um, and then I kept working with these two. Um, both of them seemed to struggle. And at the end, one of these kids was referred to the school district for a full evaluation um, and ended up qualifying for services. The other student, was put on more of a watch and see um, and to kind of monitor him because he had a very different type of a profile and, and we were um, thinking that he really just needed the ongoing practice and exposure um, in that regard. And so um, with this, we had this very different multi-tiered approach to providing this dynamic assessment type of an activity. So overall, the teacher was really, really pleased. And I have to say, me doing this within the classroom setting and giving her this highly, it really improved her instruction. And she said that and it and made that observation herself because during story time, she was utilizing the same language that we were teaching during the story champs. And she was helping the students to generalize that. And um, we even put the story icons up in the classroom, much like you would do with the alphabet. And when they would come and try and tell her what they had done over the weekend, she would just take them over there and use it as a prompt to help them put together a good personal story about their activities in the weekend. So there was just you know, by having this integrative and collaborative um, approach, there was a lot of great generalization for the students. Um, the teacher saw uh, improvements in their journal writing um, as a result of this instruction, um, and the students were able to take the skills that we were teaching um, orally and they were applying them independently because this particular project did not have that direct tie 
um, to the writing piece, which is something that I have done with a lot of my intervention with clients that come to the clinics is that we really try to make that step with them and not see if they can do it independently. Um, and like I had said, we were able to identify two students that were in need of further evaluation, one to just monitor and the other one qualified for services. So um, my point with all of this is that, um, you know, I want you to be aware that dynamic assessment has been around a while. I also want you to be aware that it's evolving into other things. Um, things that I would probably say are different with what I did versus what I would do um, if I was a clinician in a school. Um, so because it was research, I had to test every child every single time. Um, in the real world, I would not do that. I, I, I'm not going to even pretend that I would. Uh, I would definitely assess the kids that I had concerns with and maybe two or three of the kids that were in the regular classroom instruction just to kind of make sure because they're going to continue to improve. So I can't just shoot for the previous level that the students were at but when we first tested. I've got to keep monitoring where the rest of the students are going because I'm trying to close that gap, not just get them to point B. Um, I recorded the samples and had multiple coders and we checked and rechecked. In reality, um, especially once you're familiar with the task, this is something that can be scored as you're giving it. Um, and so it's a very quick assessment that can be scored online. Um, I also consulted with the teacher and I would continue to do that if I was doing it as a clinician, um, because I think the teacher was a really valuable source of information that helped me to make better decisions about who to go into which groups and which levels that I might not have made had I just been looking at the students independently. And so um, I think that is a really important piece um, of this particular project that um, is, it helps it to make it a little more real world. So, you know, in reflection, you know, was this RTI, MTSS type of activity beneficial? We were able to identify students who needed further evaluation. Um, at the same time, we were able to improve the skills of the other students. And to me, that's a win-win. Um, if I can do something that then will benefit other students as well, especially in schools like West Virginia, where we know we have low SES kids and they all are in need of a language rich environment in order to um, be able to meet their college and career readiness standards. Um, we've got to figure out creative ways to influence that classroom instruction. Um, and so I think that's really important. And we were able to utilize research tested activities, which is one of the key components that we're supposed to be able to do within the schools. And so I think that was an important piece of this. So um, this kind of concludes the instructional video on dynamic assessment. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have additional questions or would like some access to resources. Um, there are these, This is just a few examples of references that are available through ASHA. Um, giving specific examples of dynamic assessment that have been done and, you know, I only included ones that where they had good results, so you don't have to filter for that with these, but um, obviously you would want to look for studies where um, they were able to see good change after that.